Of all the crazy over-the-top stuff in Warhammer 40k, the thing that we don't really get to see very often is team-ups amongst enemy factions. And that's because in Warhammer, pretty much everybody hates each other. Shocking, I know, considering that this is the grim darkness of the far future where there is only war. Now, that's not to say that team-ups have never happened. Most of the time, they are incredibly short-lived or involve some kind of mercenary work. And these instances are a drop of sand in the desert that is the bloody wars that have been waged across the stars. Possibly one of the most well-known, infamous, and misunderstood examples of a team-up like this occurring was the time the Blood Angels and the Necrons worked together to fight off the Tyranids. A lot of Warhammer fans know about this instance from a quick little passage that was in the 5th edition Blood Angels Codex, or the endless barrage of memes and quips that were generated by the community. But very few people know the actual true story of what happened. And it's a lot more interesting than people tend to give it credit for. It had some pretty dramatic revelations about past and future events, and not to mention a crazy twist ending that involved, of all people, one of the Primarchs. So today we're going to be taking a look at what actually happened when the Necrons teamed up with the Blood Angels. But first, a quick shout out to this video's sponsor, and then we're going to dive headfirst into the Grimdark. In 2023, we're all busy all the time. We don't have time to be worrying about what we're going to be having for dinner or trying to make time to go to the grocery store. And if you're like me, you probably made a commitment to eating healthier in the new year. So now's the best time to try out HelloFresh and make sticking to those goals a reality while also saving yourself a whole bunch of time and money. HelloFresh is here to help you eat better by delivering fresh ingredients and super easy recipes right to your door. And speaking of freshness, their ingredients travel from farm to home in less than seven days, meaning they're always super fresh. They have 40 weekly recipes to choose from with exciting new flavors being added all the time. And it doesn't matter what kind of lifestyle or meal preference you have, as HelloFresh has recipes sure to please just about everyone at the table, from calorie smart, carb smart, veggie, or even family friendly meals. Cooking has always been a passion of mine. I absolutely love it. But if I'm being honest with you, I tend to fall into a rut where I end up going back and forth between the same three meals over and over. HelloFresh lets me experiment with new dinner ideas that I wouldn't have thought to make on my own. Not only are they delicious and I end up finding something new that I absolutely love, but the best part to me is that by following their recipes, I learn a bunch of tips and tricks on how to be a better cook. I've made breaded chicken about a thousand times in my life, but I had never thought to use crunched up onion fritters as part of the breading. It was delicious and now that little technique has been added to my cooking arsenal forever. So if you're ready to start saving time and money while also eating some amazing high quality food, then go to HelloFresh.com and use the code WESHAMMER65 for 65% off plus free shipping. Again, that's HelloFresh.com and use code WESHAMMER for 65% off plus free shipping. Big thanks to HelloFresh for sponsoring this video. The first time the Warhammer community would ever be introduced to the concept of the Necrons teaming up with anyone, let alone the Blood Angels, was in the 5th edition Blood Angels Codex, released in 2010. To say this instance was met with a hefty dose of criticism from the community, it would be putting it mildly. There were definitely fans of the idea out there, and people who loved seeing enemies team up to face against an even greater evil. But the thing you really need to bear in mind is that 5th edition was when the Necrons as a faction went through a complete overhaul. Before that, we had never heard a Necron speak outside of a single unit known as a pariah. They were this unknowable eldritch evil, this thing that would just show up and eradicate everything in its path. There was no reasoning with them, no talking to them, and we didn't even really understand what their motivations were. Hell, the lore even said that we couldn't study them or understand their technology because whenever they died, all of their bodies and equipment would phase out of existence. They were supposed to be this unknowable galactic evil that was completely incomprehensible and incompatible with human existence. Now, in modern times, there are certainly still a lot of elements of this in the Necrons lore, but now we know a lot more about their different dynasties, the motivations of all the major Necron characters, and we know a lot about their culture and personality. Characters like Trazen the Infinite, objectively one of the most popular characters in all of Warhammer 40k, didn't even exist before this time. Any named characters that did exist were completely silent, and we really had no idea what made them tick. So this particular story, and honestly, calling it a story is kind of a reach, as it's really just a single paragraph meant to flavor some of the background fluff, went completely counter to all of this. In 2023, with what we know about the Necrons now, a story like this could theoretically take place, but back then, it was completely unheard of. In 2014, we would end up getting a short story known as The Word of the Silent King, 
that shed a lot more light on the events of Gahana and had some really interesting implications about the Necrons, the Silent King, and of all people, the Primarch Sanguinius. And bear in mind, it wouldn't be until seven years later that the Silent King officially returned to the setting. Okay, so with that bit of backstory on this particular piece of lore out of the way, let's dive right into it. The story begins with one of the Silent King's Praetorians retelling the events of Gahana to Anrakir the Traveler, a Necron that travels from Tomorrow to Tomorrow with the ultimate goal of fully reuniting the dynasties. He tells him that he will need to understand everything that happened because in his great mission, he was going to need allies, that he would need to understand their strengths and weaknesses completely if he ever hoped to hear the Silent King speak to him. He reminds him of their history and that for a long time, they had known of the great devourer known as the Tyranids. It had been the Silent King himself that first encountered them, during his self-imposed exile that he committed to after ordering the Necrons to go to sleep in their tomb world 60 million years ago. He recognized the great and terrible threat that these ancient entities posed to all life, and thus he returned to the Milky Way. For many cycles, the Silent King worked towards his ultimate goal of committing all of them to oblivion, at first simply studying and observing them from afar, before ultimately committing to their eradication in person on hundreds of battlefields across the stars. The narrator mentions that him and the other Praetorians moved amongst the stars freely, traveling from dynasty to dynasty, always working towards the ultimate goals of the Silent King, even if that required working under a different overlord. They were not only his eyes and ears, his left and right hand, but were most importantly, his voice. But when his wordless call came, when they were beckoned to join him at his side once more, it didn't matter what they were currently engaged in, they would answer the call. This was one such occasion when the silent order came to join him on the world of Gahana, a meaningless name to the Necrons, but to the humans, one that seemingly held biblical significance. It was here that a great and terrible battle would be fought, secrets of the past and implications of the future revealed, and possibly the most unlikely of occurrences would take place, an alliance between the living and the dead. For three weeks, Commander Dante led the third company of the Blood Angels against the Necron invaders. It was stated as being a dry, dusty grind, and the only blood that fell upon the wastes belonged to the Angels. Something that Sergeant Machiavi felt was wrong. There was nothing to satiate the Blood Angels' thirst. For millennia, countless different Xeno species would invade and challenge the Imperials' right to rule this world. And every time, they were met with brutal resistance. This was no ordinary engagement. It was an insult. The only Necrons they faced were the rank-and-file Necron warriors that would materialize from numerous monoliths. There were no Necron constructs or even the elite abominations known as Lichguard to be found. It seemed like these fighters' only worthwhile ability was their unwillingness to die. And despite this, there were legions of Necrons, outnumbering the Blood Angels at least 20 to 1. Against such overwhelming odds, the Blood Angels adapted a strategy relying upon speed. If they kept moving, their enemy was not able to track them, as their gauze weaponry required careful aim. They struck them down by the dozens, taking heads and blowing apart armored torsos with point-blank fire, before retreating to regroup and hit them again. The Blood Angels felt as if they were being sacrificed. Whether or not that had been the plan or not was irrelevant. Unlike the mechanical monstrosities they fought against, there would be no resurrecting for them. But they believed there was at least purity in that, something the immortal Necrons would never understand. If this was to be where the third company perished, they would go down fighting. But then suddenly, there was a pause. A great stutter rippled through all of the Necrons. For just a second, their eyes all dimmed in unison. And then they turned to withdraw. The Blood Angels were completely shocked. They had no idea what was going on. They were literally making their last stand, and the Necrons were mere moments away from total victory. Yet, they were retreating. It was like they simply forgot there was a massive battle going on like the Blood Angels ceased to exist. More insults. Enraged, many of the angels would turn their guns on the retreating Necrons and cut down huge swaths of them. But it made no difference. The Legion kept marching, not so much as even noticing their slain comrades. The Blood Angel narrator at this point in the story tells us it didn't make any sense. Why would they give up when they were so close to victory? He tells us they didn't realize it at the time, but it came down to raw, cold, mathematical logic, an algorithmic determination that would come to stun the entirety of the third company, Commander Dante especially. They had misjudged them. They had misjudged them so badly. You understand, Lord. The angel humans were never our real foe in this. 
Mere happenstance it was that placed them in opposition to the Silent King's plan. That, and their characteristic unwillingness to admit they know nothing of the true nature of the universe. For as much as the human empire considers itself the height of evolution and the antithesis of the Tyranid race, if you can believe such a thing, they are perhaps more alike than either of them could know. The Voltan once likened the humans to insects. They swore, they cannibalize, they live without real thought for the future or the past, beyond the propagation of their own brood. And they build hives, literally teeming with human vermin and other even more degenerate life forms. Their settlements that collaborate around the points of industry and resource, openly abusing their worlds to feed the wasteful cycle of war and procreation. Even their ruling classes may live out their entire organic lifespan within a 10 kilometer area. Such is the self-contained and parochial nature of the hive cities. In all our time, we have rarely witnessed such edifices constructed by a sentient race. They are stockpiles of humankind in all its stripes, concentrated cells of organic filth, biomass, bait. The Praetorian reveals to us that the Silent King had been tracking a particular high fleet splendor for many cycles. Either his vessel went completely unnoticed by them, or they simply didn't care that he was there. In either case, he observed their movements and studied their reaction to external astral stimuli. He began to calculate ahead, and in his wisdom, he managed to track their trajectory, figuring out exactly where they were going to end up, the hive world of Gahana. Our cold bodies hold little interest for the devourer. At best, they might be drawn to the more physical power sources utilized by our technologies, or defend themselves when we strike them, but fodder for their living ships we are not. The hive worlds of the humans shine like beacons in comparison. The Tyranids are drawn to such banquets by a singular predatory hunger. The Silent King knows this, and the beginnings of a plan began to form in his mind, as he would later tell us. He would lay a trap for them and he would bait it with humans. The story cuts back to the Blood Angels, seven of them, including Commander Dante, Captain Tycho, Machiavi, and four of the surviving squad sergeants stood around a hololith, battered and bloodied. They had been trying to figure out what exactly happened with the Necrons, until their long-range scanners eventually picked up that a Tyranid fleet was closing in on their position. It had been many hours since the Necron retreat, but the news of the incoming Tyranids was still fresh to the Angels. Dante demanded to know how the Necrons were able to figure this out before them. They came to the conclusion that it wasn't that they were able to detect things better than they could, it's just that the Blood Angels had turned their full attention onto the immediate threat on the ground, rather than focusing their scanners out into the void. They lamented that they were focused on the pageant while they should have been focused on the hall. The reality of their situation began to sink in. The battle against the Necrons was anything but a certainty and would have been a fearic victory at best. But now, they were going to be caught between them and a far greater enemy. One that had the ability to destroy an entire world on its own. Despite the overwhelming odds, the Blood Angels swore to Dante that all of the companies would stand with him until the last in defense of the Hive World. Suddenly, the hololith that they had been standing around and had originally been displaying a flickering green image of the nearest Hive City blinked out along with every visual feed, lumen, and power system in the strategium chamber. They were plunged into complete darkness. Static began to seep through the dead channel of their Vox systems, while motes of greenish light ran upwards from the table surface. There was a terrible, rasping sound that began to build upon itself, pulsing in strange, eddying waves. The static began to give way to something even more frightening, a voice, a voice that was artifacting from the incomplete signal source. The motes of light swirled together in the center of the table and blocked out the shape of a giant emerald glaring Necron face. Humans, prostrate yourself before our magnificence. Two of the captains immediately went to put themselves between Dante and the Xenos avatar, but he pushed them out of the way and looked on in disbelief. I am the Judicator Prime. I am charged with securing your cooperation. You will not resist. Whom among you holds authority? Dante stepped forward. He said between clenched teeth that he was the master of the Adeptus Astartes chapters known as the Blood Angels, and demanded to know who this intruder was to address him in such a manner. The Avatar regarded him with blazing white eyes. 
I am the Judicator Prime. I am charged with securing your cooperation. You will not resist. Dante of the Blood Angels. Dante doesn't understand what this thing is actually telling him. Until mere hours ago, they were locked in Mortal Kombat. And now this Cretan spoke of cooperation between the two factions. He swore and told the figure that no such cooperation would ever take place. The Necron Avatar told him that he was incorrect and that their success had already been calculated. The conflict between them and the Blood Angels had been an error. One of the Blood Angels' captains tells the Necron that he doesn't get to decide that, that they would end this on the field of battle, that while they stood, they would never take the world of Gahana. There was a pause, and then the Necron repeated himself that the conflict had been an error. He tells them that this had been a decision of the mighty Zarek, last and greatest of the Silent Kings. There was an uneasy silence in the room as the Blood Angels turned and looked at each other, unsure of how to react. Dante narrowed his eyes and looked back at the projection. He asked, The Silent King, the Silent King is on Gehenna. The Avatar told him that he was and that the King wished to treat with them at a specific location. They were to send their emissaries there unarmed. With that, there was a sudden flash of blooming colors and the projection vanished. The Blood Angels began to discuss what to do. The Master of Sacrifice, Tycho, demanded to be sent alone, but Captain Dante refused this. He would go in person to meet with this Silent King. This was an opportunity they would never get again. Perhaps no human ever would. The Silent King was just a mythological figure, a boogeyman, the supreme ruler of all Necrons. He hadn't even been confirmed to be real by the Imperium. Yet here he was, right now, and he wanted to speak to them. If nothing else, this was an opportunity to eliminate a target of such inconceivable importance that it was worth the sacrifice of not just all of the Blood Angels, but every living soul on this world. Sarak would have it be known by every Pharaoh of every dynasty that he is a just and noble ruler. Before the great sleep, he realized his failings and vowed to atone for them. He is humble enough to learn from his own mistakes. The Necrons will rise once more, and he will lead us into a new and glorious age as the preeminent masters of creation. Not because it is his right, but a privilege that he would first re-earn. Yet his benevolence has its limits. It is not to say that he harbors the humans any particular malice, simply their supposed destiny is incompatible with our own. Perhaps if they had ascended more powerfully in an earlier epoch, then they might have claimed this galaxy out from beneath the slumbering dynasties, while the Silent King still dwelt in self-imposed exile. And perhaps not. The propensity for self-destruction is troubling. The Tyranids are anathema to all life, and life is what the Necrons require for supreme domination. So too, then, is the primal destiny of the Devourer incompatible with our own. The humans create, the Necrons maintain, the Tyranids consume. There can be no lasting symmetry in that triumvirate. One must fall. The Great Zarek has decreed it shall be the Tyranids, and none can refute the word of the Silent King. It is unlikely that the humans can see things as clearly as we do, Lord Anrakir. Ironic, is it not? that they gnash their teeth and cry out at the injustice of a new alien race polluting their empire. We have seen this before, and doubtless we will see it again, when all of this is but a footnote in the annals of our great triumph. Who will even remember the name of a dead human emperor, or the ignorant miseries doled out in his name? Staying true to their word, the Necron Court had in fact been waiting for the Blood Angels at the specified location. There were hundreds of Praetorians standing sentinel before the Silent King's throne. It was a gathering of their order that had never and perhaps would never again be witnessed by humanity. The Silent King stood at the center of a great altar, with his Judicator Prime and High Chronomancer in attendance, as well as seven Pharaons of the seven dynasties that had sworn themselves to the Silent King's purpose in secret. Each and every one of them wore a bronzed mask that hid their identity from all but their own household guardians. The Blood Angels appeared on the horizon and approached in a rhino, its tread stopping mere inches from the Judicator Prime, who had descended the polished steps of the throne to meet them. The angels reluctantly stowed their combi melters in the overhead storage of the rhino and stepped out to meet their Xenos host. The Blood Angel narrator of this part of the story tells us that Dante's face was set almost as serene as the golden mask that he held so carefully in his gauntlets. 
He had the expression of a man that knew that destiny had smiled upon him, no matter what the cost of that fortune might ultimately be. But in that moment, he seemed almost the mirror image of Sanguinius. As much as they despised the Necrons, this was a matter of respect. The Silent King was offering a treaty and wanted to speak with them, so they would honor that request. One of them joked that he was pretty sure that Dante just wanted to hear him beg for their help. The Judicator Prime led them through the assembled legion of Necrons towards the altar, and when they approached, he commanded they kneel before the Silent King. Now, one of the Blood Angels said that he was no king of theirs, and so they stood their ground, while the rest of the Metal Legion in unison bent their knee in supplication, all except for one figure. He was taller than the rest of them, and his mechanical body was something like a work of art. It was more finely crafted than any suit of armor Dante had ever seen. Whereas the other Necrons seemed skeletal, he was lithe, where they were animated with grim, unyielding purpose. Every movement he possessed spoke of undeniable vitality. What he wore on his face, though, shocked and enraged the Blood Angels. They felt no reverence or awe like the other Necrons seemed to think that they would. Instead, that mask caused them to feel nothing but unbridled hatred. Noticing the flesh forms attempting to process what they were seeing, the Judicator Prime transmitted a signal to all of the Praetorians to be ready. Even though they had in their attendance their most respected battle leaders as a sign of good faith with the angels, humans were unpredictable and nihilistic. The Silent King wore a gold mask, almost a mirror image of the one Dante held in the crook of his arm. It was a death mask in the semblance of Sanguinius. But whereas Dante's had a furrowed brow and showed the great angel's anger frozen in time, the one the Silent King wore had a serene and peaceful expression, almost if it had been modeled after a version of Sanguinius from a time long ago. And as much as the Blood Angels were pained to admit it, that it was obvious that no human creation would ever even come close to capturing the great angel's elegance quite as well as this Xenos work of art had. It was nothing short of blasphemy. It is curious what the humans choose to know of their past and what remains unremembered. They do not heed the lessons they have already learned because they often elect to forget them. Perhaps had he not fallen to illogical and prideful infighting, their sanguineous angel might have steered them towards a more enlightened destiny. Certainly he would have made a more amenable emperor than a preserved witch corpse. If ever there were a human to be mourned, Noble Zarek would say that it was him. That alliance, the first alliance perhaps, might have ended the threat of the Devourer before it even surfaced. At least the Tyranids might never have been drawn to this galaxy in the first instance. Sensing the tension, the Judicator reminded the Blood Angels that no harm would come to them. They were welcome guests so long as they respected the sanctity of this court. Through gritted teeth, Dante cursed. Your silent king had best learn to speak and explain why he insults us with this mockery of Lord Sanguinius. It is a travesty, and I shall not suffer it. If he thinks to make his demands more pleasant by skinning them in the face of our holy founder. This is not so, Dante of the Blood Angels. Mighty Zarak, last and greatest of the silent kings, honors your angel father and the accord that he wished to strike with him in ages past. That is a lie. Our gene sire never would have treated with Zeno's filth. The Silent King cannot lie, Dante of the Blood Angels, for he does not speak. He will not speak, not to you. But your angel father would have seen the wisdom in this alliance, and we hope that you will as well. The Tyranids are coming, whether you or we choose to remain or not. The conflict between us was in error. Our success has already been calculated. Numbness spread through the Blood Angel's chest, and despite the blasphemy that the Xenos was speaking, they remained calm. And although their left hands were very close to forming into fists, the trio relaxed and let their left hands fall to their sides open-palmed, a gesture that the Judicator mistook as a sign of reverence for the king as their natural superior. Dante demanded to know what the Necrons wanted with Gahana, why they would seize the world and defend it when the Blood Angels had come to reclaim it. Shockingly, the Judicator speaking for the Silent King informed them that they never seized this world. They were not conquering it. They were setting up an ambush in order to defend it from the Great Devourer. The Necron Court gave no indication of their intention. Now, if they had been made of flesh, they may have demonstrated subconscious body language that portrayed their true motivations, and the Blood Angels may have been able to pick up on this. As they were, they were completely unreadable. But could it have been true? Were they really trying to defend an imperial world? 
Had humanity really misjudged them that badly? The Judicator tells them point blank that the error had been the Blood Angels. But in fairness, they had not made their intentions known, and wasting time fighting against the Necrons, they had lost a significant portion of their forces that could have been used to fend off the Tyranids. They were out of time, and the Silent King wished to formulate the alliance that he had pursued with Sanguinius so long ago. The Judicator looked at Dante and told him to join them in order to save this world for the Imperium. Dante is not convinced, and asks what the Necrons care of the Imperium and its people. The Judicator tells them that regardless of what he might believe, they were concerned for the survival of the human race. There were greater matters at stake, and perhaps one day, when the galaxy was finally at peace, their lesser differences could be reconciled. With great solemnity, Commander Dante stepped forward and extended his hand to the Silent King. I cannot speak for the Imperium, and I cannot speak for what my blood father Sanguinius would or would not have done in my place but my warriors will lend their numbers to yours. If you truly mean to save this world from the Great Devourer. He paused, and his expression became more fierce. And then you and I will speak of the future King Zarak, if this alliance is honored to its end. The Silent King stepped forward, off of his altar, and grasped Dante's wrist, in a gesture that was remarkably imperial. He leaned in with an alien grace, and whispered something in Dante's ear. Whatever words he spoke, caused the chapter master's eyes to go wide with shock and confusion. But he quickly composed himself, nodded to the Silent King, and departed. The Alliance had been accepted. Now, here's the thing. Although this story, at its inception, is presented as a somewhat beautiful tale of two polar opposites managing to put aside their differences in order to fight off a greater threat, with the potential of perhaps forming a true alliance someday, this is still Warhammer. It's still the grim darkness of the far future, where there is only war, both sides were planning to betray one another. First and foremost, the Blood Angels had rigged their rhino with the warhead of a cyclonic torpedo. When Dante realized that the Silent King, not just some Necron overlord, not even a pharaoh of some powerful dynasty, the actual Silent King himself was on Gahana, they made the decision to trigger a massive explosion that would have leveled everything in 500 kilometers of the rhino's position, making the ultimate sacrifice of not just themselves, all of the Blood Angels that had made camp nearby, but also the billions of souls in two nearby hive cities. The opportunity to take out such an important target would never again present itself, and the sacrifice would have been worth it. Speaking of sacrifice, the Master of Sacrifice Tycho had wanted to take on the mission alone, but Dante reasoned that a sole nihilistic warrior going to meet the Silent King would have tipped them off to their true intentions. And thus Dante was willing to sacrifice himself as well to make sure their plan went off without a hitch. It was only the golden mask the Silent King wore, and the revelation that he had been on the verge of an alliance with their gene father so many years ago that stayed their hand. Was it even true? Did it even matter? When they returned to the Rhino, they disabled the warhead and removed the remote triggers they held in their gauntlets. If at any point one of them had made a fist with their left hand, the warhead would have detonated. They realized the gravity of what they were doing, entering an alliance with a Xenos abomination. Chapters had been excommunicated for far less, but Dante reminded his brothers that what they did, they did for the Imperium. If they had refused the Alliance, then Gahana would have fallen, and billions of souls would be consumed by the Tyranids. By joining with the Necrons here, they would be able to save them. When the fighting was done, Dante swore that he would kill the Silent King himself. It seemed like the perfect solution. They would use the Necrons to ensure Imperial victory, and then strike down their king once they had secured his confidence. It wasn't until after the battle had been won that they realized how utterly and thoroughly they had been deceived by their supposed allies. The Necrons had followed through on their word and did assist the Blood Angels in repelling the Tyranid invasion, fighting together side by side, defending a world they claim no right to. But beforehand, they had already moved the vast majority of their fleet out of range of the Angel Scanners, letting them believe that they had only a couple of ships to spare. They let the Angels believe that they alone had superiority in the Void, and thus it was the Blood Angel ships that took the majority of the impact from the Tyranid High Fleet. While the Necron vessels remained safely out of the conflict, he also allowed them to mount a valiant and righteous defense of one of the larger Hive Cities, a maneuver that confused the Necrons as it held little tactical merit or advantage. The Silent King had maximized the effectiveness of their alliance entirely in the favor of the Necron forces, and gave the humans just enough hope for a brighter future, while simultaneously seeding just enough truth in his words to get them to commit to the cause. Doubtless they would have turned on us if the opportunity had presented itself, most especially if they had learned the whole truth. 
That was a risk that the wise Zarak could not take. Even so, it was hard not to admire the conviction with which the humans fought. They may come to recognize in time the threat of the Tyranids like we do. For that, we wear these trinkets and adornments to commemorate their sacrifice. We honor their dead, even if we do not mourn their loss. As the battle raged on Gahana, everything seemed fine at first. The Necrons and the Angels fought side by side. But each subsequent day saw less and less of the immortal machines showing up to fight, until eventually the Blood Angels were standing completely alone, a handful of survivors and conscripted mortals from the Hive Cities cleaning up the last of the Tyranid invaders. They realized that the Necrons had committed just enough forces to make sure the battle would be won, but once victory was in sight, they had completely abandoned them to deal with the rest of the Tyranids themselves. The Silent King was gone, and he wasn't coming back. They had missed their only chance they would ever get to take him out. With the battle won, Dante and Tycho stood alone in the dusty field, watching the sunset. They contemplated what to do next, and wondered aloud if they had made the right decision. Tycho turned to Dante and asked him what the Silent King said to him. Dante looked up at the sky. He said something that he thought he no longer understood. They are the rising storm, and you must become the shield. 